Praise God. So last night, I started in Ephesians chapter 6, talking about how to stand in an evil day. And I read the verses out of Ephesians chapter 6, verses 10 through, uh, well, through the whole thing where it talks about putting on the armor of God. I want to read this to you out of the NIV, or excuse me, the uh, Amplified Classic edition of that. So here is Ephesians chapter 6 in the Amplified Classic. It says, in conclusion, be strong in the Lord. Be empowered through your union with him. Draw your strength from him. That strength which his boundless might provides. Put on God's whole armor, the armor of a heavy armed soldier which God supplies that you may be successful to stand up against all of the strategies and deceits of the devil. For we are not wrestling with flesh and blood, contending only with physical opponents, but against the despotisms, against, uh, I don't know if that's the right way to say that, but anyway, King James says against principalities and against powers, against the masters of, uh, master spirits who are the world rulers of this present darkness, against the spirit forces, wicked, uh, wickedness in heavenly supernatural sphere. You know, last night, this is really the main point that I was trying to get across, that what we're dealing with, either individually, if you're dealing with uh, cancer, sickness, poverty, uh, depression, loneliness, anything you're dealing with on a personal level, or the things that we're dealing with on a national level, it's not just normal things, it's demonic. We have a spirit of antichrist. There is not a spirit of anti-Muslim, anti-Buddha, did you know that you can go, matter of fact, I just read last week that they started a Satanist club at one of the high schools and the guy is openly promoting it and saying that I have my rights to have a Satanist club and stuff. Nobody's going to speak against that, but boy, you start a Christian club and I guarantee you, you'll be criticized and you'll have people come against it. Brothers and sisters, it's not natural. It is a demonic power that we're fighting. And if you don't recognize that, all that means is you're destined to lose the battle. You have to resist the devil in order for him to flee from you. He's not going to flee by you ignoring it. You've got to recognize it's demonic. And that's what this is bringing out very clearly here in the Amplified. In verse 13, it says, Therefore put on God's complete armor that you may be able to resist and stand your ground on the evil day of danger. And having done all, the crisis demands to stand firmly in your place. Boy, this is what I was really trying to emphasize last night, that we've got to stand. We, we got a lot of wimpy Christians today that will not take a stand. They won't stand up for anything. And this is saying that you've got to stand firmly. Verse 14, stand therefore, hold your ground, having tightened the belt of truth around your loins and having put on the breastplate of integrity and of moral, uh, how do you say that? Rectitude and right standing with God. I don't even know what moral rectitude is, but <laughs> sounds good. <laughs> Amen. Let me get back to the version that Jesus used here. <laughs> So in Ephesians chapter 6, here's how you stand. In verse, uh, in verse uh, 13, Wherefore take unto you the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day and having done all to stand. Stand therefore, having your loins girt about with truth. You know, I also touched on this some last night, but truth uh, according to Jesus, John chapter 17, verse 17, he said, sanctify them through thy truth. The word sanctify means to make holy. It's a word we get saint from. Sanctify, set them apart is also what that word means, through thy truth. The thing that sets us apart is the truth of God's word. And this is what this is talking about. As you begin to take unto you the armor of God, you have to have your loins girt about with truth. And again, like Jim was saying earlier this morning, a belt in the Bible days wasn't something to hold your pants up. It's what you held your weapons with. 
and things like this. It's depicting, all of this is armor. It's depicting a soldier. And on that belt is where you had your sword, where you had all kinds of things. And truth needs to be the thing that completely surrounds us. And again, I talked about that last night. It could be talked about so much more, but this is the dividing line between everything that's godly and ungodly is truth. Satan is the author of all lies. God is the author of all truth. If it's a lie, it is of the devil. I don't care what the person looks like, how famous they are or anything else. We've got to get to where we take truth and let truth triumph everything else. God's word is truth. And so we have to have our loins girt about with truth and having on the blessed breastplate of righteousness. You know, this is something that when, man, I used to teach on this for weeks and weeks and weeks at a time. We could put so much effort into this. But righteousness is not talking about your actions. It's an imputed righteousness. There is a faith righteousness. There's also a righteousness that is, uh, we often call it self-righteousness, but it's a righteousness that's based on your actions. And did you know that you need both? You actually need both. You need a self-righteousness, but it's useless when it comes to relating to God. You have to understand that God does not relate to you based on your self-righteousness. Let me turn over here to Romans chapter 10 and show this to you. If I back up into chapter nine for just a couple of verses, this is Romans chapter nine. And in verse uh, 31, it says, but Israel followed after the law of righteousness. This is what Jim was talking about. They tried to obtain it through the Old Testament law through living right and doing right. And they didn't obtain unto it because you can't ever be holy enough just in your own actions. The law wasn't given to set you free. The law was given to bind you and to show you how far short you have come of God's perfect standard. Man, religion has totally misunderstood this. But it says, talking about these Jews, that they sought, they followed after the law of righteousness and have not obtained under the law of righteousness. Why? Because they sought it not by faith. There is a faith righteousness and then there is a righteousness that comes through your own actions. Righteousness just means right standing. And uh, when it comes to God, you cannot approach God on your own actions because it doesn't matter how good you are, you've come short of the glory of God. So self-righteousness, righteousness based on your actions, based on keeping the law, keeping on some rules, those are useless when it comes to relationship with God. You've got to have a faith righteousness, but you do need a righteousness based on your actions to relate to other people. You know, if anybody left here, man, uh, Jim was making some great points this morning about the covenant and about we're, we're right with God through Jesus and it's not based on us. If you were to take that truth and go out here and just start speeding, and so you go 100 miles an hour in a 55 mile an hour zone and they stop you and they say, do you know you were doing that? And you said, it doesn't matter because I'm righteous through Jesus. It's all based on my covenant with Jesus. Did you know Jesus will still love you the same? And it's absolutely true. He's not going to deal with you based on your performance. But the police will. <laughs> if you go out here and rob a bank or something and say, but I'm righteous and it doesn't matter what I do. It's all based on my covenant with Jesus. Well, then that's absolutely true. And as you're rotting in your prison cell, Jesus will fellowship with you and not hold it against you. And it'll be just as if you never sinned the whole time you're in prison for 20 years. <laughs> so Jesus isn't going to impute sin unto you, but people will. You need a self-righteousness. You need to act right with people. But you, when it comes to relating to God, you cannot base anything in your relationship with God on your own actions. And so this is the question that he's answering here in verse 32. He says, why couldn't they obtain unto righteousness? Because they sought it not by faith, but as it was by the works of the law, for they stumbled at that stumbling stone as it is written, behold, I lay in Zion a stumbling stone and a rock of offense and whosoever believeth 
on him shall not be ashamed. And then chapter 10, this is not a new thought. Again, men are the ones that put the chapter and verse divisions in there. There's nothing wrong with that. I'm using them. But it's not a new thought. It's not changing the subject. It continues in chapter 10, verse 1. Brethren, my heart's desire and prayer to God for Israel is that they might be saved. For I bear them record that they have a zeal of God, but not according to knowledge. You know, just being zealous for God, just having a desire for God, wanting to know God, wanting to live right is not good enough. Now, that's important that you have a heart for God, but you've got to have the right knowledge. The scripture says that his people are destroyed for a lack of knowledge. And it also says that uh, you shall know the truth and the truth shall make you free. We've got a lot of people today that have a heart for God. God has touched them. They know that he exists. I believe they're born again, but they don't have the knowledge that they need. And because of it, Satan is deceiving them. I was emphasizing that a lot last night, that this is, we've got to speak the truth in love. It's the truth that's going to set people free. So we've got people with the right heart, but a wrong head. And I guarantee you, you need to educate yourself. You need to find out what the word of God has to say. And so this is going on to say in verse two, he says, I bear them record that they have a zeal of God, but not according to knowledge for they being ignorant of God's righteousness and going about to establish their own righteousness have not submitted themselves unto the righteousness of God. So this verse right here makes it very clear that there is a God righteousness and there is a self righteousness. Self righteousness is important when it comes to relating to other people. But when it comes to God, you cannot approach God on the basis of anything that you have done. You have to approach God totally based on that covenant, based on what Jesus did for you and not what you do for Jesus. And he goes on to say in verse four, for Christ is the end of the law for righteousness. This is talking about righteousness with God. He is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone that believeth. And then he goes on and talks about this. Over in uh, Philippians chapter three, uh, Paul also talked about that he didn't want to be found having his own righteousness, which is of the law, but the righteousness, which is of God by faith. And so there are two different types of righteousness. And most people, when you talk about righteousness, immediately think about their actions instead of the righteousness that is given unto us. In 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 21, it says, For he, speaking of God, hath made him, speaking of Jesus, to be made sin for us, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. You are now the righteousness of God. You don't just have a little bit of righteousness from God. You have been made the righteousness of God. Where people struggle with this is because they look in, at their flesh and they think, how could this be righteous? They look in the mirror and they see, you know, gray hairs and zits or whatever are ugly. And you look at this and think, this is righteous. No, not your physical body and not your soulish realm. You can search your soul and find out that you've got wrong attitudes and wrong thinking. And most people functionally only acknowledge their physical realm, their physical body and their mental emotional part. But when you got born again, you became a new creature. Second Corinthians 5, 17 says, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are are become new. That's not true of your physical body. It's not true of your mental, emotional part. You know, I've talked to people today that were from Puerto Rico. I talked to a person that was from Egypt. And you know what? They still have that mental part that was taught and educated in that society. Their soul hadn't changed. Many people will still talk with the same accent. You know, I've been out of Texas for, man, 30, 40 years, and I still talk like a Texan. My, my mental, emotional part didn't change. It's been influenced and it's changed to the degree that I've submitted myself to the Lord. But my, you can't look at your body and at your soul and say that old things have passed away, all things have become new. 
But there's a third part to you that most people don't know about over in 1 Thessalonians 5, 23. He prayed a prayer that I pray, God, your whole spirit and soul and body be preserved blameless until the day of the Lord Jesus. So that right there shows that you got three parts. The physical body is obvious. Your mental, emotional part is obvious. But most people do not recognize that there is another part of you. That's your spirit. And in your spirit is where you were created righteous and truly holy. Ephesians 4.24 says, put on the new man, which again, 2 Corinthians 5.17, if any man be in Christ, he is a new man. He's a new creature. So you put on this new man, which after God is created in righteousness and true holiness. Man, I don't know if you can really grasp all of this. But your spirit man, I keep pointing to my belly because Jesus said out of your belly will flow rivers of living water. Some of us look like we got more of the spirit <laughs> than others, but somewhere, I don't know exactly where my spirit is, but I imagine it's here. And anyway, the Bible says that in the spirit, you were created righteous and truly holy. You aren't trying to become righteous. You aren't growing in it. You're growing in your self-righteousness. You're growing in submitting your soul and your body to what God has already done. But in your spirit, the moment you were born again, you were created righteous in right standing with God and truly holy, implying that there's false holiness. You know what false holiness is? It's like what Jim was talking about. You say, I've been praying. I've spoken tongues an hour a day. Now, God, will you move in my life? That's self-righteousness. That's false holiness. And you cannot approach to God. It's the mercy of God that doesn't give us what we deserve. If God gave us what we deserved, every last one of us would die and go to hell. Every last one of us. You know, I've lived a relatively holy life compared to everybody else. But man, I don't want to ever be, I don't ever want to get what I deserve. You know, God has blessed us. And just in this last year, we've seen some great things happen in our life. God gave us a brand new house that I would have never have gotten. I didn't even want this. It was above anything I could add. Matter of fact, when I went on the internet and looked at it, I thought, oh God, this is exceeding greater than anything I could ask or think. And the Lord reminded me of Ephesians 3.20 that he'll, he'll bless you more than you could ask or think. And I thought, well, it sounds just like God. And anyway, God's blessed us with this home. My, uh, uh, Jim and Mary have been over and seen it. And anyway, people will say, you deserve it. And every time they'll say that, I say, no, I don't deserve it, but I'm going to receive it in the name of Jesus. Amen. <laughs> but people are always trying to say somehow or another, you deserve this. If we got what we deserved, every last one of us would go to hell. Second... Uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 10, I believe it's verse 12, says they measuring themselves among themselves and comparing themselves among themselves. Did I get that right? Is that the right verse? We dare not make ourselves of the number of some or compare ourselves with some that commend themselves, but they measuring themselves by themselves and comparing themselves among themselves are not wise. If you are comparing yourself with other people, you aren't wise because that's always self-righteousness. But the righteousness that is from God is a gift. We receive the gift of righteousness. It's not something that you earn. It's based on that covenant. And so when he says, this is how you stand, you take unto you the truth, the word of God, and one of the first things you do is you put on this breastplate of righteousness, right standing with God. And that cover, you know, the breastplate is what covered your vital organs here, your heart and your lungs, things like this. You have to put on that breastplate because Satan is going to come against you. And if you understand that you are righteous through what Jesus did and not through what you do, that it has nothing to do with your performance, well then, man, that just protects you against all of these things that Satan is trying to bring against you. And this is one of the things that's missing in the body of Christ. I go to a lot of churches and often I'll go into a church and they'll get me in the back room and pray before the service. And one of the things that I hear a lot is people say, oh God, just make us righteous 
Oh, God, make us righteous. And I want to just say, why don't you get born again and get created righteous? What they're talking about is in their actions. They're wanting to overcome some sin, some failure in their life. And there's a place for that. You don't need to continue to smoke and drink and do drugs. You need to get over those things. So you need some self-righteousness. But when it comes to God, God is a spirit. John 4, 24 says God is a spirit and those who worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. It didn't say this is the best way to worship him. It says you must worship him this way. God is a spirit and God is looking at you and at me in the spirit. And you know what he sees? He sees righteous. If you are born again in your spirit, you are righteous. Again, I refer to 2 Corinthians chapter 5, 21. He, God the Father made him who knew no sin to be made sin for us that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. God gave you his righteousness and he didn't give you a tiny bit of righteousness. He gave you the same righteousness that Jesus has. Man, look at this, Pat. I'm not sure I can quote this, so let me turn over here to 1 Corinthians chapter 1. And in verse 26 is where he uh, says, You see your calling, brethren, how that not many uh, wise men after the flesh, not many mighty, not many noble are called. Do you know this is offensive to most people? They don't like this because well, I, I really do think I'm wise. I really think I'm awesome. And there's a lot of people that think the reason God chose me is because, man, he needed somebody with my talents and with my skills. You may not be brash enough to say it exactly the way I said, but that's really how most people think. They take offense at this. It's like God saying, you know, help wanted. If you're weak, if you're despised, if you're base, if you're nothing, if you're a reject, apply within. That's not the way that men would do it, but God says he doesn't choose many wise men after the flesh. It's not because he's against people who are wise. It's because most people who are wise trust in their own wisdom. They read their own press releases. They get excited about their own stuff. Man, God isn't a low brow. He's not a high brow. He's not against anybody. He'll use anybody, but people who tend to have it all together in the natural tend to trust in themselves. And that's the reason that God chooses the not many wise men after the flesh, not many mighty, not many noble are called, but God hath chosen the foolish things of the world to confound the things which are wise. And God has chosen the weak things of the world to confound the things which are mighty and base things of the world and things which are despised hath God chosen, yea, and things which are not to bring to naught things that are. And why did he do that? In verse 29, that no flesh should glory in his presence. God delights in using people with all kinds of flaws and weaknesses and stuff so that when God flows through them, God gets the credit and not that person. And then the next verse says, but of him are you in Christ who of God is made unto us. This is talking about Christ is made unto us wisdom and righteousness and sanctification and redemption. Jesus is now your righteousness. And if you sit there and say, well, all of my righteousness is as filthy rags. That's a quotation from Isaiah 64, 6. And that's true if you're talking about self-righteousness. And did you know that the word for filthy rags there in the Hebrew is literally talking about a menstrual cloth is what it's talking about. All of your self-righteousness is like a menstrual cloth. It's like something that you want to throw away and get away from. And yet today people frame their self-righteousness and hang it on the wall so that everybody can look at it. This is what Paul was talking about when he says, whatever was gained to me, you know, is counted but lost for Christ. And I count it but dung. We frame our dung and put it on the wall. That's all talking about self-righteousness and all of your self-righteousness is like a filthy rag. And this is offensive to people. And so there's people just sitting there saying, you know, all of my righteousness is like a filthy rag. Well, if you're born again, you're either talking about your self-righteousness, which that would be an accurate statement, or if you're talking about who you are, your true identity, then you would be calling Jesus a filthy rag. 
Because Jesus is made unto us wisdom and righteousness, sanctification and redemption. Jesus is now your righteousness and God looks at you in the spirit and he sees you as righteous, as holy, as pure as Jesus is. Do you see yourself that way? You know, when the Lord first showed this to me, I was still in the Baptist church and man, this just rubbed everything I'd ever heard. They, they did emphasize that without Christ, we're nothing. Jesus even said that in John chapter 15, verse five, without me, you can do nothing. Now, I agree with that hundred percent, but I'm never without Jesus, <laughs> amen. I just was focused on who I was in the flesh. The Baptist church was great at showing you your failures and showing you all the things that are wrong. And there is a place for that. You don't need to have an inflated opinion of your carnal self. You need to be like the apostle Paul over in Philippians chapter three, where he says, in me, well, excuse me, that's in Romans chapter seven, but that's a good one too. In me, that is in my flesh dwells no good thing. And then in Philippians chapter three, he says, I have no confidence in the flesh. Did you know, again, that's offensive to most people who are, are motivated and they're successful people. They are sitting here promoting themselves and thinking, I can do all things. You can't do all things. You can do all things through Christ, but you can't do all things. And most people don't have this balance. You need to have a dislike for your carnal self and yet a, a tremendous uh, image about who you are in Christ. You need to have Christ esteem, not self esteem. See, this is what it's talking about in Ephesians when it says putting on the armor, the breastplate of righteousness. You find out who you are in Christ and not who you are in the flesh. I got off, I had I, somewhere I was headed. Anyway, I'm righteous. Oh, and, and the Baptist see made me aware of my unrighteousness, my failings in the flesh, which there is a place to recognize that. And when the Lord first showed this to me, I just thought, oh God, I can't say I'm righteous. I just felt like God was going to strike me dead. And yet I saw it in the word. Over in Romans chapter five, man, I, I spent a week fasting and praying and looking up every time that the word righteous, righteousness, righteousness says is used in the Bible. This is way back before we had computers and stuff. And I, I got a strong concordance and looked up the thousands of references and wrote them all out on a piece of paper and fasted. And at the end of the week, I came to a conclusion based on what the word says that I was now the righteousness of God. I could see it, but it felt so contrary to everything that I'd ever been taught that I just was afraid to say it. And I forced myself. I remember I was still in the Baptist church and I helped a friend of mine clean the church. And I went up there after hours, nobody else was around. And I went into the women's restroom because it had a big mirror. And, you know, guys had a little mirror like this. Women had to have a big mirror. So I went into the women's restroom and I remember standing there and looking at myself eyeball to eyeball and saying, Andy, you are the righteousness of God. And the first time I said it, all the hair on the back of my neck stood up. Like, oh God, don't strike me dead. I'm just saying what the Bible says about me. And I had to change the way I saw myself, because I only knew myself in the natural. I only knew myself in the physical realm. You know, Paul said over in 2 Corinthians, he says, we don't know any man after the flesh anymore. He says, we only know people after the spirit. All of our problems, all of our racial problems, all of our problems that separate people based on education, based on income, based on the way you look, or any of these things, it's because you know people after the flesh. If we were to only know people after the spirit and if we were relating to people spirit to spirit, man, it would change everything. But Paul said, we don't know any man after the flesh. And then is when he said, because if any man is in Christ, he is a new creature. You are no longer a physical human being only. You still have a physical body, but that's not the real you. The real you is on the inside. And when you got born again, you became the righteousness of God 
in Christ Jesus. And God is a spirit and God is looking at you in that spirit. And in your spirit, you are as righteous and pure and holy as Jesus is. There is zero difference between you and Jesus in your spirit. 1 John chapter 4, verse 17 says, Herein is our love made perfect that we may have boldness in the day of judgment because as he is, speaking of Jesus, so are we in this world. Religion will sing when we all get to heaven. Then that's going to be a great day. In the sweet by and by, we'll talk about heaven. And heaven's going to be a blast because we'll get rid of a physical body and this soulish mind that is a hindrance. But in the spirit, you are right now exactly the way you will be throughout all eternity. Your spirit is created in righteousness and true holiness. And as Jesus is, so are we in this world. That's not talking about your body. It's not talking about your self-righteous acts. It's talking about in the spirit. You are righteous. Man, that's phenomenal. Great God. And you know, if you understood that, if that was your identity, you would wind up living that out. But as a man thinks in his heart, so is he. Most of us see ourselves as I'm an old sinner, saved by grace. I'm not an old sinner, just saved by grace. I was an old sinner, but now I got born again and I am the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. He has imputed his righteousness. And if you could ever truly not just hear those words and maybe be able to quote them, but if you could see that and if that could become your identity, you would wind up acting like who you are in the spirit. But most of us only know ourselves after the flesh. We only know ourselves in this physical realm. And so we resist for a while. We try and live for God. But if something happens and it, and it becomes hard, we give in because we think, after all, that's who I am. I'm just an old sinner saved by grace. And so you wind up living that out. But if you could ever understand that, no, when you got born again, you became a brand new person. You are now the righteousness of God. You have as much holiness and righteousness on the inside of you as Jesus has because it is his righteousness that was given unto you. He became sin so that you might be made the righteousness of God. If you could see that and understand it, it would just transform everything. You know, I prayed with a woman today who said she was dealing with PTSD. And anyway, I asked her, I said, so what caused all of this? And she said it was uh, uh, all kinds of abuse when she was a child as well as uh, in her marriage and stuff. And, and so she was talking about this. And basically what I did was say, you're looking at what people have done to you. And I said, I'm not saying that people haven't treated you badly, but you aren't looking at what Jesus has done for you. I said, your emotions will follow what you are focused on. And if you're focused on what people do to you and all of the problems that you have in your life, you'll be depressed, you'll be discouraged, you'll have PTSD. But I said, what Jesus has done for you is so infinitely greater than what any person has ever done against you that you don't have to worry about it. You know, if you were watching the video that we played this morning, I think her name was Andrea, the lady who had her daughter die and she was sitting here grieving to the point that she was contemplating suicide. But when she started focusing on Jesus and what he has done for her, she started thanking God. And this woman now is just praising God. And I mean, uh, thriving and doing great. It doesn't matter what the devil does out here. You have been made the righteousness of God. You are in right standing with God. God Almighty, who's got an entire universe to run, loves you and spends time with you. And any time, day or night, man, he is there. He listens to you. He never is too busy for you. If you were to focus on that and focus about your right standing with God, I guarantee you it would transform your actions. Holiness should be a fruit of relationship with God, not the root it's not your holiness. It's not your actions that cause God to say that you are in right standing with him. It's what Jesus did and when you receive it. And if you could ever understand that, man, God is pleased with me. 
Not because of what I do, but because of what Jesus did. Man, that'll just capture your heart. It'll, it'll release so much love into your life that you'll serve God better accidentally than you ever did on purpose before. I was in a church in Kansas one time and I got up and I said, how many of you love God? And it was a Sunday morning service and everybody, amen. I said, how many of you want to please God more than anything else? And everybody, amen. And I said, now be honest. How many of you please God? And did you know out of probably 400 people in that service, there was two people, an 11-year-old and a 11 year old boy and a 12-year-old girl who raised their hand to say that they please God. And I said, herein is a major problem. If you really want to please God and yet you don't think that you do, I said, man, this is a recipe for a disaster. And this is where the majority of Christians live. Because they are thinking that God is pleased with us based on our actions. And our own heart is constantly condemning us and letting us know that our actions aren't the way that they should be. As you know, James 4, 17 says to him that knows to do good and does it not to him, it is sin. Sin isn't just breaking one of the big ten. It's not just the big things. Sin is when you know that you're supposed to do good and you don't do it. If you don't pray the way that you, as much as you should, if you don't study the word, you know that's sin. You're missing it. If you don't love your wife the way that Christ loves the church, that's sin. If you don't reverence your husband the way that the church is supposed to reverence Christ, that's sin. Sin is not only what you do that's wrong. Sin is what you're supposed to be doing that you're failing to do. Plus, uh, in uh, James, or excuse me, this is uh, Romans 14, 23, the last part of that verse says, whatsoever is not of faith is sin. Anytime you aren't in faith, anytime you doubt in any way, that's sin. If you're just going to approach God based on your own actions, your own heart is going to condemn you and you will never feel like you please God. And that's what was reflected in this audience. 400 people said, I want to please God more than anything. Two little kids said that they please God out of 400 because they were basing God's pleasure with them on their performance. God isn't looking at you that way. He's aware of your actions. He loves you enough that he's not going to just leave you to yourself and he'll want you to improve so that you take inroad of Satan away into your life. But God is pleased with you based on who Jesus is, based on this covenant that Jim was talking about. He sees you through the covenant. And most of us are still living like Mephibosheth or however you say his name. <laughs> Most of us are still living like him and we're fearful and thinking that, man, we're hiding out and stuff and afraid that God's going to get us. Again, most people don't doubt God's ability. The very fact that you're here on a Friday morning, you're a fanatic. <laughs> or you were drugged here by a fanatic. <laughs> Did you know this isn't your nod to God crowd on Sunday morning? You guys love God. You believe God can do miracles. You don't doubt God. What you doubt is God's willingness to do it for you because you are relating to God on your own self-righteousness. That is not putting on the breastplate of righteousness. You're standing in self-righteousness instead of God's righteousness. I tell you, when you begin to understand that you are righteous in right standing with God through what Jesus did for you and not what you do for others, Oh man, I looked at the wrong thing here. I thought it was already 1242. That's how much time I had left. <laughs> I thought I went way too long. But anyway, when you start relating to God based on what he's done for you, it just changes everything. Man, it's, it's awesome. And instead of trying to whitewash your mistakes and uh, somehow or another feel good about yourself at all expense. This is why people wind up condemning other people is because instead of them seeing who they are in Christ and resting in that, they're constantly comparing themselves with other people and trying to be better and they'll wind up criticizing and putting down other people. 
You know, one of the things in our ministry that is really good, and we've talked about this quite a bit, but I think one of the reasons that God has blessed our ministry is because I don't sit there and I'm not intimidated by other people and if they have a, an anointing or something that's better than me. You know, we have people that'll come to the school because they heard me on television, so they come because of me, but when they get to school, they wind up liking the other instructors much better than me. And I'll have people come up to me all the time. I thought you were my favorite teacher. Now this person is my favorite teacher. And most people will think, well, that's terrible. No, I love it. I don't have any delusions about me being the best minister around. And I'm the one that invited these other people to speak in the school. And I love it. But I think one of the reasons that God blesses our ministry is because I'm not intimidated. And I don't have to be better than somebody else. I found my... I found my place in Jesus. I'm confident of who I am in Jesus. I've often said that if I was God, I wouldn't have chosen me. <laughs> Amen. I'm not the sharpest knife in the drawer. I don't talk to, as well as other people and stuff, but I'm just so glad that he chose me, but I'm content and I'm not challenged. I know that God is the one who's given me the platform that I've got and stuff like that, and I'm not challenged by somebody else. You know, we brought in Bill Johnson and Randy Clark, and they've held a couple of meetings at our place. And I don't know how many of you are familiar with them, but they called it, they were from a different stream. And uh, anyway, we, we all love the same Lord, but they just minister differently than I do and stuff. And so anyway, they wanted me to get up and minister. And I mean, everything that they had done that week, it was well, not the way that I have done things. And so when I got up to minister, I said, you know, anytime you see two streams come together, there's going to be a little turbulence. <laughs> and I acknowledged that, you know, things were different, but I said, man, I see God in you guys. I love you. And did you know God knit our hearts together and we're different and, and we're better together than we are apart. If everybody was like me, if everybody was like me, it would be boring. Man, I don't want everybody to be like me. I don't want people to come to our Bible college to come out and be little Andrew clones and be just like me. Man, there's, there's tremendous power and synergy when you get people together and stuff. But you, in order to do that, you got to be secure. And you know what makes me secure is the fact that I found out that my righteousness, my right standing with God is not based upon my flesh and upon what I do. It's based on what, on what Jesus has done and my faith in him. And that does not fluctuate. It doesn't fluctuate based on my performance. Man, it is forever settled. This just brings a security. It brings a stability to your life when you quit trying to think that I've got to do these things right and then God will be pleased with me. Then God will answer my prayer. No, man, I found out the joy of finding out that it's, it's not based on what I do. It's what Jesus did. And just as much as I can stay in him and keep my mind stayed upon him, I can reap those benefits of Jesus. Man, we've seen the blind eyes open, deaf ears open. We've seen great miracles happen and it's not because of me, it's because of who Jesus is. And when Satan comes and condemns me, you know, the scripture says to agree with your adversary quickly while you're in the way. And there's multiple ways you can take that. But one of the ways I take it is just when he starts condemning me and thinks, what makes you think God will use you? What makes you think if you go up and there preach about healing that people are going to be healed and he starts pointing in, at his finger at me and how I haven't done something right. I just agree with my adversary. I say, you know what? You're right. I don't deserve it. Praise God for Jesus. I think I'll pray for him in the name of Jesus instead of in the name of Andrew. And I just stand in Jesus and who Jesus is and not who I am. I'm telling you, brothers and sisters, this is a key. It's a key to relationship with God. It's a key to your relationships with other people and everything is to find out who you are in Christ. And you put on this breastplate of righteousness and you stand there in what Jesus has done for you. 
You know, I had a friend of mine who actually pastored a church in Florida and he saw great miracles happen. They actually had an entire room that were full of crutches and wheelchairs and things where people had been healed. But this guy fell into pornography and got to where he was having two to three uh, experiences with prostitutes per day. Now, he'd go a month at a time without anything, but then he'd fall and go out and have two or three sexual experiences with prostitutes. And anyway, when he finally came to himself, he was going to kill himself, and uh, he uh, put the gun down. That's when I met him, and he started coming. And man, this guy preached on this righteousness that's in God really strong because he had no self-righteousness that he could look at. Every, he said that uh, it looked to him like in a... The way he described it was like he was standing in a place where an atomic bomb had been dropped and everything was scorched. Everything was destroyed. He said that was his life. He ruined his ministry. He ruined everything. And yet he found his identity in Christ and he began to start preaching that he was the righteousness of God, not based on his actions, but based on what Jesus had done for him. And I mean, to this day, he's uh, an effective minister and he's seeing lots of people. Matter of fact, you might, you've probably seen him on uh, the internet. He's one of those that in uh, Baylor was baptizing people in the pools and they're seeing hundreds and hundreds of people, young people born again and they're having baptisms in these uh, fountains outside and things like that. And God's using him. But in a sense, would to God every one of us could come to an end of our self-righteousness but because we may not have gone out and done what this guy did, we still feel good about ourselves. Paul said he had no confidence in the flesh. Zero confidence in the flesh. His confidence was in the Lord. That is putting on the breastplate of righteousness. And when Paul said that in Philippians chapter 3, some people would think, well, the reason you don't have any confidence in the flesh is because you just aren't as nice as I am. You aren't as good as I am. Paul went on to say, and if any man thinks that he has confidence in the flesh, I'm more. And then he began to list all of his accomplishments. And in his day, Paul had the equivalent of multiple doctorate degrees and things like this. And yet he said, I count them all but done so that I may know Christ and be found in him, not having my own righteousness, which is of the flesh, but the righteousness, which is of God by faith. Man, we all need to come to, uh, to the end of yourself. It's only when you come to the end of yourself that you really find the beginning of God. And to me, that's what righteousness is. It's not talking about self-righteousness. It's talking about an imputed righteousness that comes as a gift from God. And if you have made Jesus your Lord, you are now the righteousness of God. I don't care what you've done. It's not based on your flesh. And I can tell you, there's some of you cringing right now as I say this. And you're thinking, well, maybe if, you know, you just let out a little word of profanity once or something, you might still be righteous. But man, if you go commit adultery, you couldn't be righteous. See, you think that our righteousness fluctuates based on your performance. Again, that is self-righteousness. If you go out and live in adultery, I guarantee you, you're going to give Satan a huge inroad into your life. It's going to cost you. It's going to embarrass you. It's going to hurt other people. It's wrong. Don't do it. It's stupid to live that way, but God still loves you, stupid, because he's looking at you in the spirit and not in the flesh. And if anybody would take what I'm saying and say, well, man, this is good news because now I'm righteous in my spirit, so it doesn't matter what I do in my flesh. It doesn't matter as far as God's concerned. God's going to love you based on that covenant. God's going to love you based on what Jesus did. And you made Jesus your Lord and he's going to deal with you and look at you in the spirit realm. And God is going to love you based on that covenant. But Satan will take advantage of any sin, any inroad that you give him. It says in 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 8, that Satan, our enemy goes about as a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. He is out to devour you. He's out to make your life miserable. He's out to destroy your life. How does he do that? He can't do it without your consent and cooperation. And one of the ways you cooperate is to sin. So you go live in sin, God's going to still love you because he paid for your sin. But Satan is going to gain an access to you. He's going to have a legal right 
to move in your life because you have yielded yourself unto him. Romans chapter 6, verse 16 says, Know ye not that to whom ye yield yourselves servants to obey, his servants you are to whom ye obey, whether of sin unto death or of obedience unto righteousness. If you go out and yield to sin, you are yielding yourself to the author of that sin, Satan, and he only comes to steal, kill, and to destroy, and he is going to destroy your life if he can. But your spirit man is sealed, Ephesians 1, 13, and that sin doesn't penetrate the seal. Your spirit still retains righteousness. And since God is a spirit and he's dealing with you based on who you are in the spirit, God still loves you and accepts you even though you've given place to the devil. Man, I hope you understood what I said. Most people do not understand that. They either relate to God based on who they are in the spirit and completely forget that I have a physical body and that Satan is out to destroy me and so they live a sloppy life and give Satan inroad into their life or they get so focused on the physical realm and they're trying to perfect that and they forget that God doesn't love us based on our actions. He looks at us in the spirit and they either go to one extreme or the other but very few people can combine these things. I don't know why that is. But I've been ministering for 56 years and there are just very few people that keep this in balance. That without Christ, I'm nothing. But I'm not without Christ. And in the spirit, I am the righteousness of God. And you have to be able to have your identity and who you are in Christ and yet at the same time not forget that it's important how you act and that you live appropriately. That's taking on the breastplate of righteousness, not your righteousness, not self-righteousness, but God's righteousness. And that's how you stand. And boy, if you can do that, you will stand against anything the devil can throw at you. The only thing that Satan's got against any of us is our failures. He's not going to come and tell you that Jesus isn't good. Jesus doesn't deserve it. Jesus would, you know, he, he can't solve this problem. None of us are struggling with that. We believe that Jesus can do anything. We just doubt his willingness to do it because we relate to him based on self-righteousness instead of a faith righteousness that's imputed by God. Man, if you can take unto you the whole armor of God, this righteousness of God, it'll transform your life. Amen? So Father, we love you and we thank you, Father, for making Jesus to become sin for us who knew no sin so that we could become the righteousness of God. Father, thank you for making us righteous. Thank you for giving us your righteousness. And I just pray that the Holy Spirit helps people to understand this and receive it and find their true identity in Jesus and not in their own actions. Thank you, Father. We just agree and we receive that. Thank you for it in Jesus' name. Holy Spirit, I believe that you burn these truths into people's hearts, that this will not leave them and that we will stand com complete in what you have done for us. Thank you, Jesus. Father, we agree and we receive. You know, I gave an invitation last night and we had 11 people, I think, born again. But if you don't know Jesus... I've shared things with you today that you could receive because some, some people think, but I, you just don't know what I've done. You don't know what Jesus has done. It's not based on what you've done. It's based on what Jesus has done. Jesus took your sin into his own body on the tree and he died so that we might be made the righteousness of God. It doesn't matter what you've done. God loves you in spite of who you are, not because of who you are. And you could receive a faith righteousness. So I'd like to ask our prayer ministers to come up here today. And if there's anything that we could do to help you, if you, for whatever reason, kept God at arm's length thinking he couldn't embrace me, you need to come and let, you need to humble yourself and just, you know, the scripture says, confess your faults one to another and pray one for another that you might be healed. And we're down here to pray with you to help you any way that we can.